Hi, this is Mitch Harris from Napalm Death and Menace, and here we are on Metawani. Woohoo! Hello, Mr. Mitch Harris. How are you doing? Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Yeah, good. Imagining what it's like in India there. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 summertime. Uh, very tough for us to figure out what's happening during the day because it's generally too hot. Yeah, I'm from Las Vegas, so I understand that. Okay, that's cool. So uh, you guys were on road a few days back. So so how has been the response? Yeah, it was a good tour. It's a lot to do in France to do nine shows, but mm -hmm. um, they all did very well and. For some reason, I don't know, maybe we've done Hellfest two years in a row and, and lots of people have seen Napalm live and they, they want to catch us this year because mm -hmm. we're not playing Hellfest, so it's oh. kind of cool. <laughs> that, that's really great. And I also came across news where uh, I got to know that you guys are uh, tracking drums last week uh, for the new album. So uh, what's happening in Napalm Death Camp <laughs> these days? Well, that's the second part of the session. So uh -huh. we already had we already had ten songs recorded with me and Danny, and Shane did five last week. And there's Ooh. still another, maybe eight or nine to go before we choose our favorite songs to really work on. But wow. um, yeah, it's going well. It's um, I don't know. Like, let's if we go from time waits to no for no slave, and then smear campaign, mm. then utilitarian. That was like a trilogy to me, and this is like a slightly different approach uh -huh. now and it's it's more concise like uh -huh. straight like uh the songs are shorter probably and and more intense uh -huh. and there's a lot of nostalgic atmospheres but also some groundbreaking territory and it's wow. it's, pr it's pretty fast but also lots of time changes and rhythms and the vocals are very aggressive he's screaming his head off from what <laughs> i heard already he's got a few done with the vocals and the drumming sounds good. It's a it's a different uh, drum tone and mm -hmm. guitar sound. So and there should be a different bass approach as well. Wow. But um, it's all like maximum intensity. So it should be uh, interesting to see what people think. Wow, that's cool. Uh, what uh, should I uh, guess? Some twenty odd tracks are there already uh, on the on sheet, and then you're gonna choose your favorite ones from there. Well, there should be like twenty three, mm -hmm. and then. Yeah, we should wind up with 18 or something and bonus oh, tracks wow. and things like that. That's the but yeah, it, it shouldn't be too long. Mm -hmm. It's like, even if the material's good, I w I'd like to keep it to the point right. instead of like, you know. But then again, it does take three years before we go between albums now. So sure. it would be nice to see, um, you know, uh, because, you know, it takes a long time to play the entire album. In right. fact, we only... Act Normally, we only play six songs off each album, so mm -hmm. it's a, it's kind of a waste sometimes when you have good songs and they never get played live. So. Oh yeah, that's true. Well, it is to me. <laughs> <laughs> it it is in general. I mean, when you don't get good songs to play live because there's already a bunch of songs already in the list. Yeah, I mean, there's songs that we always like to play from the the old, the older material, yeah. and we change that around too. But it there still has to be a balance, you know. I mean, personally, I would go every year and play just the entire new album, wow. and people would would see it and say, "Wow, it's like a new band." But I miss "Suffer the Children" and "Scum" and things like that. It's like, <laughs> right, so it's that's hard. That's awesome. It's better to play. It's not good to play more than one hour with Napalm because, you know, it's like a workout at the gym for everybody <laughs> in the room. And after that, you know, it's about time to go and uh, either get some food or go to right. bed or get a have a drink <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely true now on uh, the previous album utilitarian uh, had a lot of melodic passages and and more dissonant riffs than the usual napalm death material uh, which is more like you know like you mentioned the straightforward approach so you know would you say such elements creep into your you know music due to your experimentative side or would you say this is a natural progression 
Well, everything that we do in my head has always been a natural progression and a logical progression. And it's too easy just to keep doing the same formula, even if it works. For me, it just doesn't become exciting. Like when there, when I do come across a part that I know from the history of our band of everything we've recorded, I, I know like we've never done that before mm -hmm. or we've done something like that before, but not with a blast beat underneath. So if right. we change formulas i mean really all of us listen to it a bit very varied styles of music because right. there's only so much crazy shit you can hear i mean we hear it we're exposed to it all year with all the bands we play and festivals sure. and stuff so and some of them i like but also it's important i've just listened to the radio and when the song is boring next song mm -hmm. next station next station and yeah. then i say oh that's good what's this and there's so many melodies really right. and and i'm intrigued with the way that uh, they structure their songs and how how it takes like how they can make a three minute song from one rhythm you know True. whereas like with napalm it's there's so there's so many parts to the song sometimes or frantic changes that it's, right. it, it's hard it's hard to carry a melody over that True. when there's um you know sometimes dissonant riffs or minor chords but they go so quickly that it's hard to build on it so right. on the utilitarian there was a few things I was more into discipline and minimalism even okay. though in a napalm context that's mm -hmm. still pretty crazy but uh, sometimes the the more time you have t to work with it you can build on the melodies like the Absolutely. wolf I feed the wolf I feed was a song that there was one section and it gave me goosebumps and I said oh that would be a good singing part <laughs> so I was writing the lyrics and within 10 seconds I had the melody so I said wow Oh my God! I think I figured a form, a trick. <laughs> you know. So after that, then I I started working on the Menace album, and I right. decided I, um, well, started finishing the Menace album, yes. and I, I I said I wanted to do more of the clean vocals because obviously in Napalm, if I tried that approach, it would take the band into a radical d change in direction, and right. also be compared to other bands that really we shouldn't be sometimes. So, you know, I focused on that and like. I was like, okay, studying that part and how and why did it work and like how can I make more of that and build and learn about singing and not so much about the the what's it called like being a a trained vocalist, but more so finding melodies okay. with your voice uh -huh. with, that could would normally just be another guitar line, you know. Right. So I was trying to let the vocals carry the melody instead of tr cluttering it like the more parts you put on it then it becomes limited where the voice can go so <clears throat> right th that was the most fun for me and also having uh, the lyrics and expressing all the things that I was going through in emotional times True. and build, building atmosphere and trying to find dynamics that it's difficult to have dynamics even with rhythm changes and fast and slow when right. everything the guitar is always on maximum distortion with bass and gain and you know the drums are need to be hit hard just right. to cut through the mix and before you know it it's really hard you know right. so and not not always like acoustic to heavy acoustic to heavy you need to find a way to <clears throat> somehow build right things which also carry the song and and you know absolutely uh, yeah that's af right affect affect the human psyche true that's absolutely true <laughs> Now, you know, you joined Napalm Death in, in probably two decades ago, 1989. Uh, and, you know, you were part of the legendary, you know, Harmony Corruption album. And, and, and since then, there's been no looking back. Now, you know, a lot of fans and critics have noted the shift in musical direction that Napalm Death saw in the Harmony Corruption era related to their earlier material. Now, you know, with, with some deeming that the band adopted a lot of classic death metal elements into their songwriting, so would you say that your joining the band at that time affected the stylistic direction of Napalm Death? No, because when I joined, <clears throat> Mick called me and said, will you come? And and uh, we are also getting Jesse Pintado because mm -hmm. we want two guitars. And, and I said, oh, I know Jesse. Wow, he's one of the main writers for Terrorizer. I'm one of the main writers. Well, the, the main writer, Righteous Pigs and Defecation. And Shane is a writer you know, with Unseen Terror and Shane right. plays guitar and also writes lyrics and Mick wrote songs on a two string guitar like Suffer the Children and yeah. Un Unfit Earth and lots of songs. Mm -hmm. And 
and Barney wrote all the lyrics for Benediction, and I wrote all the lyrics for, right, well, most of the lyrics for Righteous Pigs and Defecation. Ooh. So I thought, wow, together it's a team of, of writers that can, it would really take 10 years before we, um, you know, when you do four songs each on one record, it takes, I don't know, it, it doesn't, it takes a long time to build. Right. And, and between albums, our musical directions changed so much over the years, True. you know, we also became interested in melodic and atmospheric and soundtrack music right. and techno drum and bass <laughs> alternative, whatever, yeah. you know, hip hop, all kinds of whatever's good. <laughs> right. And um but when when we joined Harmony on Harmony, Shane uh Mick told me that they already had the the album was already written. Oh. And I said, Well I'd like to at least write one song. He's like, All right, then you write one and Jesse will write one. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote Mind Snare and oh, uh, cool. which I I would do differently now, but at that time at that time it was epic. Uh -huh. I would I mean I you know we all appreciated some of the death metal stuff that was coming out. Like I really loved Atheist uh -huh. and Obituary and obviously Death Leprosy was one of my favorites. And you know we all loved Possessed and the Creator Destruction, all that stuff that I loved, and all the hardcore stuff which had metal guitar right. like. DRI, COC, SOD, The Accused, Cryptic Slaughter, Celtic Frost, all this. So together, our influences were similar. And the difference is, really, I mean, there's not much difference material-wise between Mentally Murdered and uh, Harmony, Harmony Corruption, corruption. Mm -hmm. really. I mean, in theory. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, because we had two guitars, for some reason, well, Jesse had done Terrorizer, and that was tuned to D, and I did Stress Related, which was tuned to D, uh -huh. and which is higher, because normally some Napalm stuff was a C or even B, and like the A side of Scum was E, which is really high, but the riffs were still heavy. Like Celtic Frost was an E, which is high, right. but the riffs were heavy because of the bass. Right. And um, So anyways, with, with the fact that we tuned to D, that the strings had a different presence, presence and... Yeah. Also, the fact, <clears throat> obviously, working at Morris Sound, which was good to have uh, an engineer like Scott Burns that really knew, had experience in that kind of music because recording in Las Vegas, I would go into the studios with Righteous Pigs and we're screaming all these extreme things. I hope you die in a hotel fire. And these guys are like Mormons and, and have, they, they only record right. Elvis-style lounge music and they have no idea what the hell is happening. You know, True. They're like, don't fart in the room and things like that. <laughs> No burping in the microphones, and yeah, it was really like don't oh, wow. eat, don't eat in the studio, studio. and it's <laughs> seventy dollars an hour, and you pay all this money, and these guys just don't have a clue. So Scott Burns, we had the confidence knowing he had it all under control, but right, um, of course, you know people, it, it, it's strange because when we did the mixes for the album, and and we listened in his truck, which was like you know in America, most people listen to music in the car. Right. It's just simple. It's like yes. on the way to work right. or on the way home from school or wherever. That It's always the in the car. and listen to the songs. Yeah. I mean, now it's different. They watch it online in the comfort of their own home. Yeah. But not so. Or, you know, back in the day, we always listened to music at parties. We would bring our favorite or make compilations and put it on cassettes and uh -huh. go to someone's house and they're playing, you know, like White Snake and stuff. And we say, excuse me, can we play some music for a minute? And they say, oh, no, the thrashers are here. <laughs> you know, oh, they're ruining our place. <laughs> and uh, right. so with, with Scott handling everything, mixing it in the truck, it sounded perfect. But cool. when you heard it on a home stereo, it sounded more like less bass and the guitars were a little bit thin, mm -hmm. maybe. But... It, it's one of them things. So in Europe, the people heard that album and they thought, oh, it's a it's a big departure. You know, the album, it right. doesn't sound like Napalm Death. And I was thinking, well, I don't know who's to say what that should be. But personally, um, it wasn't until we did the Mass Appeal Madness EP right. when, when I felt like, now that's what I imagined before I joined the band. And I was like, wow, what can we what what would it sound like? Yeah. And that that's what I expected, really. And Ooh. we were going in that direction. So I, we basically tuned the guitar a little lower to C sharp. Nice. And um, and I gave it, I don't know, I used a bass amp for my guitar sound oh, with wow. a distortion, trying to get more bass in Too the heavy. sound. Right. And um, it's also a different kind of control when you pick, you know, to, to control the guitar. Right. But um, that's so I've always worked from that sound, really. And then, it's awesome. you know, 
Utopia banished. By that point, Mick had left the band, mm -hmm. and then, you know, we were still tuned to C Sharp, and we brought Danny in, and and that was, I think, the pinnacle of what the best, all the the best riffs that we had from, you know, like in a blast. Uh, to me, right. it was a it was a double album. Uh -huh. That was my vision for it, but everyone talked us out of it. The management and the label, like, no, it should have been a double gatefold. Yeah. One, once and for all. So then in the end, we recorded the extra songs for an EP, mm -hmm. uh, the World Keeps Turning EP. And we recorded in the studio with a different engineer, and mm -hmm. it, it sounded like shit, really. But it's a shame. So those songs kind of went to waste. But, uh, right. And after that, it kind of felt like we had done... That was like a milestone in my book of like, we did that now, now that's done now, now it's time to move forward. But mm -hmm. in people's minds, that's only two years later, and hey, we're going into Fear, Emptiness, Despair, which is a totally different approach with mm -hmm. less fast parts and more different guitar lines and noisy bits and more sure. mid-tempo and, and melodic and trying to capitalize on the fact that we had two guitarists and not just playing the same thing. and. Building on that, and True. and then we got signed, licensed to Columbia Records, which was out of our control. But they didn't know what to do <laughs> with it, you know, and and it it didn't sell enough for to meet their standards up against Michael Bolton and all that shit. Right. So we we got dropped, and then after that, uh, we started doing like I can't remember diatribes inside the torn apart. It it really we were still experimenting and learning new chords and. To me, it's all part of Napalm's history. I, I saw it like Rush or King Crimson, how they varied from album to album throughout their right, careers. Yeah, that's true. And whereas, whereas many bands in the scene either they had no interest in expanding, expanding or, or, just or they were happy, or they were happy with that style because that's all they know, that's all they right. like, and they live and breathe that. But there were so many bands like that. I wanted Napalm to be in a different field, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. We all kind of felt the same way but then some people just wanted napalm to be fast and extreme and yeah. just stay intense and that's, that's what you expect but see i thought it was extreme because it was something you didn't expect and it, it should be like you never really know what you're gonna get when you mm -hmm. hear yeah. a napalm album so True. there's a there's an element of fear element of you know, surprises like, man. yeah yeah so somehow you know it works and it takes time to settle in and grow on it so yeah. over the years you know we've we finally got to the point where okay we've kind of done that now mm -hmm. so if we add some more intensity back into enemy of the music business and faster drumming and right. more intense parts to me it's not that much different from fear emptiness despair really it's just we tuned higher again mm -hmm. and uh, riffs were more clearer and it had a different attack and a different sparkle and a bite it also improved his vocals because he was singing higher without realizing it Right. And uh, it was a different kind of intensity, so we built on that since the year 2000 and taking it to different levels. No. But again, only having four songs each for an album is kind of hard to to do everything you want to do in that short space of time. That's true. So, especially when your best songs come at the end of the session and you go, oh no, now I have a killer song and I have to wait two years to do it. Oh my God, what am I going to do? What if someone else does that? Well, that so. <laughs> Yeah, it's, that's, it's, that's, I completely agree with that. Now, you know, you, you've seen the, the entire, you know, the grindcore scene and everything from past two decades. Now, there have been many new bands that have come into the scene, have been releasing, uh, some are releasing, you know, very good albums, some have been lame. So according to you, what's your opinion on the new bands releasing, you know, material which is somewhat closer to Napalm Death? Well, I'm glad that somehow what we've like focused our entire youth on has become some kind of scene and an yes. establishment and the fact that i mean the thing is as soon as that word grindcore was like a stamp and a seal of approval right people say okay so that's grindcore then and they think that and that limits their spectrum of like what it really could be right. and which direction it go it's like the rule is from from the beginning, there were there were no limits in music, and Napalm took that to an extreme and built on that. And then it's like, well, where do you go from here? The, you know, there's other styles of extreme music as well. True. It depends on what it is that makes it extreme. There's stuff on the radio that's quite extreme, really, and that all has to do with because the barriers were broken down. So right. if if people just 
focus on that, like their favorite grindcore bands, and they like music a certain way, mm -hmm. and they play everything a thousand miles an hour and tune really low and just scream and grow. You know, it's like you could go to a festival of that kind of music, and after, to me, it's good for about an hour, you know? Mm -hmm. But after like 12 hours of it, it's like, or three days of it, it's like, okay, you know. The only band yeah. I really remember is the ones that had these crazy masks on, mm -hmm. and you know, and they weren't really very good. But you know, I I appreciate and respect that people like that style of music. And then maybe after some time, they'll feel like they want to do something else, but maybe afraid to because they'll say that's not grindcore. It's Correct. like there's no rules, remember? Because that's how Napalm Death started by breaking the rules. And then is that all they could do? No. So, you know. Maybe it'll take people 50 years to really realize <laughs> what yeah. and why and how that made an impact on the scene. Right. And like the, the metals or even alternative. I mean, some bands I met from Smashing Pumpkins and people like that, or, or, or this band Lush, they were like an indie band. Mm -hmm. they, they were like big Napalm fans inspired by that, and they took that guitar sound to another level and in a different style of music. So you think, wow, it, it did affect them you know like mm -hmm. um, a lot of bands really like the mid temp the mid years like the 95 onwards type yeah. of stuff so they were it so it, it did reach different people which is good but you know on the other hand we could have played it safe and just did the same thing again and again the same formula like it works for acdc and you know but after a while it's like it starts to sound like I remember that, and that yeah. sounds like this song, and this sounds like that song, and hey, that's great because that's all I ever want from ACDC. Right. But you know, after a while, it it gets a bit watered down with the same formula. True. So I mean, that's that's why I, I admired the Beatles. They made two albums a year, and they they progressed so quickly, and with technology, and they pushed the limits and the boundaries, and they were like a boy band, really. And and they weren't totally taken seriously as musicians, so oh, as in songwriters. So they they pushed the boundaries and they innovated to the point where studio technology fucking expanded and they had to make yeah. desks for forty eight tracks so they can record with the whole orchestra and like right. you look at the, the doors and they did their first ten out five albums on eight track, you know, mm -hmm. four track the way it was recorded and it's really weird. Ooh. To, to see that the Beatles pushed the boundaries. And I, I was thinking how the fans must have been like, oh, <laughs> okay, I, you know, I want to hear Love Me Do or like help and stuff. And it's like, the I am the walrus and shit like that. Or A Day in the Life. I mean, what did people think then? A five minute single that's on the radio? But it worked and it, it got and out there. And, right. And then 10 years later, when I found the Beatles, I found that the most interesting stuff. Or like Black Sabbath, like Never Say Die album, I thought was very innovative. But at the time, music was changing in that genre, and maybe they were overlooked, and they moved on and got went different ways. But right. you, you look at, it's the pushing the boundaries thing that, that makes it innovative, and exactly. if there's none of that. For me, I just lose interest, but for other people, they can make a career on one simple formula. But I would have never personally been satisfied. I would have had to move on to something else, really, right. because just... I don't know. You spend your life doing something. You have to like it first, you know. Yes. And then if other people like it, cool. If not, well, then you try something else. But you know, you, you have we, to be happy with the stuff you write. Yeah, but we're also big fans of Napalm before we were in the band. So mm -hmm. we've seen other bands in the past that that changed so drastically, and right. also it didn't it didn't quite work, and they've ruined their career and kind of spoiled the name and the the. Uh, the meaning of that so, band when people when people talk about a band they get a feeling and they talk about that feeling they get and if it doesn't work with that you know so for me it worked for other people maybe not but it's the point depends, that right you know i just i don't know who can who can say really but for me that's, that's the best way right I agree. but I, I wanted to make sure we never really took napalm to that's like like with the Menace album that I really wanted to do. That's a big part of me. That's like, it says a lot from my side of my soul and things that yes. you don't really share with people. That's not the way I see Napalm. Mm -hmm. You know, this is more like a personal exploration and, okay. and you can't, I was like, I wouldn't do that, you know, to, to people. <laughs> right. Because, <laughs> Even though you know, I, I would be happy. Uh, like, I have my limits too, you know. I had this thing in my mind because I kind of felt that, you know, Menace is, is an outlet for, for the musical aspirations that are in a possible 
to execute outside the napalm death style you know that i kind of got the feeling because the moment i heard the tracks you sent me i could easily figure out that it's more like a personal j- journey for you uh, in order to explore different things which probably you might know you know might not have done with napalm death yeah i mean there's there's a lot of songs there i could have used for napalm but i felt they had they needed this extra aspect of real strings or I don't know, somehow to make more of the emotion, the feeling I got from the songs and like what I was going through and and if you can create, I mean, do you get a feeling when you talk about Menace? Like, you know what I mean? You you heard it and you felt it and you, there's these moments where you go, oh, wow, there's this harmony. It gives me goosebumps or something. And you just remember that really. So I don't know. I need a vent, if you know what I mean. Everyone yes. does. Yes, everyone needs a vent for like, sure. A place where you can be totally yourself without criticism and without living up to something you've already done. It's like it's time to start a new thing, really, that where people have no expectations. If I call that meat hook seed, they would say, "Okay, but still, it's not as good as the first one." <laughs> that's it's that's like, true. Well, what did you expect? It's been like twenty years, and you know, so that's the that's a bad thing about so much time between these personal endeavors, you know. Right. So one person moves on and like the next menace album would be maybe more removed than people would expect and they'll say it's not as good as the first one but to see that's not the point the point is completely the opposite you know impact velocity you know uh, uh, like th- there are people who are unfamiliar with this and, and and they need to be aware of you know what sort of stylistic leanings and sounds are present on this album so you know i understand the motivations of this project has basically been to explore yourself to a much wider uh, you know uh, spectrum of music so for those who are unaware with the band and with unaware with the new album uh, how would you you know give them an explanation of what menace is all about well in my head i i would have liked to do some things differently because it was all based around heavy guitar mm-hmm. which puts it straight into the rock category categorization any way you look at it it's mm-hmm. still rock based if you take the guitars and drums out and hear just the strings and vocals it's like a completely different thing it's not even in a genre right the the actual melodies you know if you look at it like a different way of approaching with the same song so i did this on purpose to put things in context where it seems like a logical progression mm-hmm. from Napalm, whereas there is lots of other songs I have a, lo- a lot of soundtrack electronic songs which are like have structured like Beatles songs, Ooh. and and also I thought that would be too much for people to understand. It just would not compute at all. But the the problem is is that somehow the label is introducing the band as this is Mitch's other side, like Mitch from Napalm Death, and it's yeah. like. That. It's kind of like <laughs> shooting yourself in the foot, really, because there's maybe a 30% of the audience that will really get it and love it and understand it. And the other people would say, okay, that's cool, but it's not really my thing. You know, they'll, exactly. come, back to, they'll come back to it in five years. Exactly. But the word Napalm Death, when it's on this mainstream, like there was lots of mainstream web support, like this thing, all music. It has like a million hits every yeah. month. And, it, and, and these people... You know, the video was premiered on there, and so many people might have read it or come across it, but the words Napalm Death, they automatically assumed that that's not my thing. Yes. I, you know, yes. I've heard of it, and I know what to expect. Even though they're saying, no, you don't know what to expect, they just don't take the time to listen to it, which is right. fine, really. But So, in a way, it's limited to the Napalm audience, and it'll come and go probably like it never happened, mm-hmm. and some people will really get it. But I say it's like every time I do a project, I have ideas to do a tour, and we never can because of schedules or something, yeah. and 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 it disappears like it never happened. So this right. time, by October, we're gonna tour this thing and Ooh. like hopefully play with the right kind of bands to you know hit those yeah. people that have never heard it and they've never heard a Napalm, and in fact they don't know who the fuck we are. They just hear the songs and judge it for the music. So if in fact there was it had some sort of commercial play like on MTV or something. Yeah. I think people would get it because they're seeing a cool video and they don't know who's in it. They just hear the song. And it's really, I don't want to be judged for who I am or who we are or what we've done or what we're known for. It's a case of something else, right. really. And 
it does have all the overtones, undertones from everything we've done, really. But it's a case of, I don't know. For me, when I hear music, I need something more, something like that band Ghost. Ah, uh, they released. The, the band has surprised us. Uh, I know they've surprised us completely. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, whenever I meet uh, different artists who come down to India, and I know uh, I see my friends wearing a Ghost T-shirt, they'll be like, "Hey, that band! I love that band." I mean, those guys have managed to strike a chord with the kind of music they have. But the, okay, when someone told me about Ghost, they said it's oh, it's a, a mystery mystery band. No one knows who's in it, and it's like a merciful fate kind yeah. of thing. Right. And I was like, or King Diamond or whatever. So I heard it expecting the high falsetto vocals and, you know, those great riffs and stuff. But instead, the vocals were more singing, yes. kind of like a progressive... Um, it, it's that 70s, I don't know, uh, you know, the 70s kind of writing, you know, that 70s kind like, of Like, yeah, approach. Journey, yes, Journey and exactly. Foreigner and Europe in, in that respect of, like, those kind of melodies, which... I was like, wow, I like that. That's cool. So that's that's why I did like it. And I was like, the music, yeah, I see what they mean about the merciful faith thing, but not really. It's yeah. still it's different. So I was like, not like I listen to it every day, but when I heard it, I was like, this I like. Mm -hmm. I could get into this, but I mean, I spend most of my free time making music instead yeah. of listening to right. it. The other, if something's good, it'll come to me. You know, I hope. Or why is everyone talking about this band? And I'll, I'll give it five minutes and go, eh, or, <laughs> mm, you know. Right, but right. It, I mean, my inspirations come from elsewhere these days than w what's happening. I'm never like concerned really what's going on in mm -hmm. the extreme world because we got that much to do already. Right. That it's like I don't want it to affect my writing. Or sometimes you you have an idea and you hear someone else's band and you go, oh. They have the same part that I was just working on or something similar, and it pisses <laughs> right, me off, and then right. I won't use it. So I'd rather just let it be free and true and real. It happens spontaneous. And, oh, you can compare it to... Like, the thing is that's so funny with Menace is uh, what, when I read the reviews, they compare it... I'm not going to name any bands, but they, they compare it to so many bands only in our genre of music, mm -hmm. only what they've ever heard with heavy guitar and sing, clean singing, whereas... Uh -huh. The vocal aspect comes stems more from the Beatles and the Doors and Pink Floyd and Zeppelin and like classic rock stuff, Alice in Chains and you know like not them in particular, but the way they used vocals and harmonies and to build it, you know. And but no one mentions these bands. They mention something, and some of these songs were written in 1997. Ooh. So and and they compare it to bands that didn't even exist. Then so I'm like okay you can say what you want but I wrote that song so long ago and it doesn't offend me it's just you know they at the end of the day I think it's really hard to classify and describe yes. so after one or two or three listens they'll go oh yeah I've heard that before, something like that before I'll just pull these names out of a hat and mention that because people need to know what it sounds like and it's like well yeah but it doesn't really <laughs> so anyways it's kind of frustrating but at the end of the day, it's like, what? Why did? How could you mention a band that? Okay, but I've never even listened to them, listen or to them. like, right. or like, I've heard them, but it didn't inspire me at all. It was sure. more like, this is coming from here, but obviously they would never know. But yeah, it's just one of those things that comes with uh, trying your best to, to express yourself. <laughs> Absolutely true. I, I was discussing with you before the interview that uh, India needs Nepal death. They, they, they need, uh, you know, that one hour of, you know, dose of Nepal death in India. Uh, while discussing with the promoter, uh, you know, we had sort of bands in mind and, and then when we fixed, uh, you know, uh, Mayhem and we were told by Necro Butcher that, you know, Nepal death should be on the list. So it's really going to be an you know, honor to have you on this year's uh, Bangalore Open Air list. So I just wanted to know, like, uh, to whom do we get in touch with? Uh, do, do we have to get in touch with a booking agent who takes care of the band or is it going to be a direct approach with the band or how is it going well, to work? Well, um, okay, first of all, Necro Butcher is a great guy, man. <laughs> he, he was always there every time we played up there and, and he was just always mellow, down to earth, great guy. Yes. And it's, it's really cool that he mentioned that how come Napalm hasn't been here, you know? What the fuck? <laughs> But believe me, we've been wanting to come for years. We like to play in what we would term exotic places. And especially to see that there's a scene 
an extreme scene. I, I wonder, what's the hardcore scene there like? I know that they like metal. Yeah, but uh, is... if I tell you the hardcore scene, it's, it's uh, I would say uh, fans here in India are, are diverse, okay? Uh, you, you, you'd find progressive metal fans, you'd find, you know, doom metal fans, you'll find basically everything here. It's not just, okay, uh, India likes thrash metal or India likes, uh, you know, let's say progressive metal. We've had close to 20, 30 odd bands who have come to India from past two to three years and they have been of different genres. So, and it's, it's really been a great, you know, time to check out those bands and to see them guys live. So if, if you talk about the hardcore scene, I would say it's not just the hardcore scene, which one should look forward to even, you know, a grindcore scene in India is top notch. So cool. there's something, there's something to, you know, look forward but to. For me, I think it's a shame because it's not fair that you've had to wait so long because there's yes. probably, there must be people there that have been listening for the last 25 years or more. Uh, but you know if i can tell you when we saw slayer live two years ago uh i saw a family you know at the gig a father his son and a grandfather three so, generations right? yes the entire generation you know were there seeing slayer live and i couldn't believe to see that you know a six-year-old child had you know bought his father and his grandfather had also come to see slayer live so you that's know, cool. those things are really you know rare but it's really cool to see that happen. Yeah. And we, we like to be the first band that's ever been on the moon. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like right. first, first time we went to Russia, first time we went to South Africa and China and uh, Malaysia and Indonesia and all these places that n nobody knew what to expect. And India was always like that. But some bands beat us to it this time, which I'm... Uh, <laughs> but still, yeah, If I would love to do it and you know hopefully play more than just one festival if mm -hmm. we're there we'd like to do at least three or four shows we don't mind Ooh. traveling and hopefully days off in between they don't have to be big shows mm -hmm. great shows or whatever we we can make it work you know just we want to reach the people like when we toured japan we did 10 shows also shows around or wait maybe it was six i don't know around mm -hmm. the tsunami areas yeah, and yeah, places right. we like to play places that no one ever goes to okay sometimes that affects the main one show in the main city that everyone travels to mm -hmm. but we also like, to, like to see the country and, and right. have some time to understand what it's like I, everyone says how amazing india is and the fact that i mean there's some countries that just don't like metal really oh. or like you know that kind of thing right like right. even in china you would think there's so many millions of people but really the metal thing was like mm -hmm, like a new like they weren't really sure they hadn't really been exposed to it so right it was like i'm sure india will be rocking and and yeah to make sure it happens i mean the best thing just contact me and then we'll do an email cc uh first get the offer and the date just assume 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 we're playing and then i'll just make sure that when it's ready that wow. it goes through the management agent and make sure that that's cool you know because that, that, that it gets a response because right. they get offers every day for yeah. shows and it's kind of it takes them time to respond sometimes so it's I, better right i have checked the site and uh, i'm aware that you uh, you guys have a show till 8th of september and uh bangalore open air is slated to happen on 12th of september so i i, I don't see any dates uh, on the website which is post 8th so 12th september mm -hmm. is is the date where we have decided to have bangalore open air this year so uh if there's any other shows on that particular week, uh, if you can check, that would be really helpful. Okay, well, I know af after these shows that you're talking about, we have, um, we're doing South America with Hatebreed for mm -hmm. 10, 10 days. Okay. But that's towards the end of September, so, ah. and, we'll, and we'll be finishing the album just before, like the last week of August. So it's going to be pretty crazy to do it. Ooh. And saying that, we might not be able to do as many shows <laughs> right. as I would like to with the schedule. But um, yeah, I'll 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 look into uh, when that tour starts, and um, yeah, we'll see. Oh, that, I can't really say cool. we can't say no, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely true. And you know that brings me to the question that, like, since we we discussed about the new album, we discussed about the new song. Uh, if I would have to ask you, uh, how would you uh, define the upcoming uh, Napalm Death album in a sentence? Uh, how would you do that? Concise? I don't know. I'd say it's 
everything you need in the Napalm album at this point. Mm-hmm. Comma. Don't expect anything except what came naturally, mm-hmm. period.